good afternoon, Reverend Dr. Good. This is Reverend Wilbur Winborn, 19th Street Baptist Church. And I want to say thank you once again for being willing to come and to share and to talk. And uh, as always, encourage, encourage our heart, my heart and 19th Street. And so we wanted to uh, talk about the legacy of 19th Street and Reverend Walker. So just had a few questions that we could be able to share with and uh, share with on our website and be able to help people understand our story. So uh, the first question is, how did you come to know Reverend Charles Walker and the 19th Street Baptist Church? Uh, I came to know uh, Charles Walker and the 19th Street Baptist Church through uh, John F. White Sr., mm -hmm. uh, who was a member there. And I believe he, uh, I know he was a digging. I'm not sure. He may have been chair of the digging board at one point there. Uh, and I got to know him through uh, a person by the name of Hardy Williams, who ran for the state house and state senate in West Philadelphia. Uh, and I got to know him because the three of us got together uh, and formed something called the Black Political Forum, which was a way of uh, developing uh, political power for African Americans, especially in the West Philadelphia area. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and when uh, the pastor before Charles Walker left, uh, uh, John White said to me, uh, I want you to meet my pastor, mm -hmm. uh, my new pastor. And he took us out to, uh, to dinner uh, and I met uh, Charles Walker, uh, and I was very, very impressed with him. Uh, and one of the reasons I was impressed with him because uh, the uh, white waitress uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, book binder, it was uh, down, downtown book binders, uh, uh, said something that was not proper, and he uh, stepped to uh, the, the waiter and said, uh, you cannot use that kind of language around uh, Christian men, and, uh, and I won't want you to apologize. And so the uh, wait, waiter said, I'm not going to apologize. And so uh, Charles Walker went and found uh, the owner. Mm. Uh, he's the top manager there, and and told him what happened, and said, "I want I want this man to apologize for all these gentlemen here," and uh, and he apologized. Mm. Uh, and and I, and I I just saw that as a just a very strong uh, black man who wanted to make sure that that the people of color uh, was was uh, uh, respected and it was that was my first meeting with him mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, spent some time with uh, John White uh, at the church mm -hmm. uh, but then John White um, uh, and his son left the church and went to another church in West Philadelphia. But I stayed in close contact with Charles Walker, and he was just a good friend mm. and someone that I loved spending time with and loved spending time to hear him talk and just loved spending time to hear him preach uh, and love and loved to hear him just uh, engage in conversation mm -hmm. uh, and talk about God and talk about his ministry and talk about what he was trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was the same year that he came to uh, 19th Street Baptist Church. 
Uh, in fact, it was uh, before he had preached his first sermon there uh, as pastor. Uh, he had been there to preach, of course, before, but it was the first before he preached his first sermon as pastor. I met him and 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 I and and spent uh, time with him often uh, and uh, spent time with him uh, in the hospital before his mm -hmm. uh, his death and it just was a man that I just loved to hear preach, loved to hear talk, mm -hmm. uh, and just loved to hear him talk about uh god and talk mm -hmm. about jesus and he, he was just a joy to be around in this history mm -hmm. i knew that's right so so reverend walker my my dear pastor is a leader and you are a leader and leaders they they gravitate toward each other so how would you describe your leadership style and how has your leadership style evolved you know, over the years, even before, say, meeting Pastor Walker. So how would you describe your leadership style and how has it changed and evolved over the years until now? Uh, the, the, the First of all, I want to say that that experience with Pastor Walker and I uh, was something that taught me a great lesson. And that is that my role as a Black man Mm -hmm. uh, was to always defend the race and always defend uh, black men and women Amen. in the presence of uh, white men and white women who mm -hmm. wanted to disrespect black men and black women. And, uh, and I, I ought to do it boldly and without fear. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Charles Walker taught me that, that if someone is doing something out of line and you are in year reach then you have to step up and let them know that that is unacceptable mm -hmm. uh, where you are and unacceptable uh, language unacceptable words that you use and and demand an apology hmm. uh, and that's something which i learned from him uh and that's something that i from the point i met him on i always uh had the courage to stand up and say, you can't do that in my present. Mm. You can't do that in our present. Uh, and you owe all of us an apology. Mm. Uh, and so I was able to get a great deal of courage from that one meeting with Pastor Walker. Mm. Uh, my one meeting was that it just taught me to be bold and courageous in the face of people disrespecting uh, African American in their presence, and mm -hmm. I, I've never since that time not been able to boldly stand up and speak out. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen. Uh, in the past, we talked about your 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 journey, and you you've always told me about how God will put people in your path, and God put Pastor Walker in your path. But God has put other people in your path to move you to where God would have you to be. Um, well, I, 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 I uh, my story is just a very interesting one. Uh, I was born in Seaboard, North Carolina, and when I was uh, sixteen years of age, my uh, uh, father uh, went to prison mm. uh, because he, uh, they called, uh, assaulted uh, because he, he, he slapped a white man who insulted my mother. Mm. Uh, uh, I call it a, a brave, courageous black man who did that. Uh, and so he was in prison for a few years and while he was in prison, the family actually relocated uh, from Seaboard, North Carolina to Southwest Philadelphia. Uh, and I was a block and a half from the First Baptist Church at Pasco. 
uh, and did not know very much about the church. Um, but uh, one Sunday, my mother said, there's a church around the corner here and grab uh, three of us boys who was living there uh, and said, we're joining church <laughs> uh, and took us by the hand and walked a block and a half to the church and we joined church. <laughs> uh, and uh, two weeks later, I was uh, standing on on the um, outside of my house uh, and a young man uh, my age, about 16, named Stephen Bishop. I had seen him every Sunday walk by my house. Mm. Uh, and uh, and I asked him one Sunday, where are you going? He said, I'm going down to BTU. Uh, I said, what's that? He said, that's Baptist Training Union. Uh, I said, can I go with you next Sunday? So he said, yes. And I went down uh, next Sunday, that was at the same church that my mother uh, took us to join. Uh, and I met the first lady of the church who was running BTU, mm -hmm. named Muriel Lemon. Uh, and uh, she subsequently, uh, uh, her husband Lemon died, and then she married her Johnson, uh, husband Johnson. Uh, died, uh, and uh, and then she remarried again. Uh, but while she was at that church, uh, I was at John Bartram High School, mm. uh, and the counselor there told me not to even think about college. Mm. Uh, when I asked her to fill out the applications for me, they don't even think about it. Uh, you, you don't belong in college. I get a job in a factory. Mm. Uh, and in fact, she said, I have a job uh, for you. I, I can talk to the people over there. It's uh, not far from your house. Mm. Uh, and so she got me a job in the American tobacco factory. Uh, that was uh, a block and a half from where I was living at that time. And I finished high school and went to work in the uh, American Tobacco Company, uh, better known as the Cigar Factory by the people who live in the neighborhood. Mm. Uh, and my uh, first lady, Meryl Lemon, uh, found out what I was doing and she said, you don't belong in that factory. Mm, mm. Uh, uh, we're sending you to college. <laughs> All right. uh, and uh, I graduated uh, in January. That's when the uh, school system had uh, January and June's graduation. Mm. I graduated in January, and um, by August, I had been admitted to a number of colleges and decided I was going to Morgan State University, but they did all of that. And then they took up offering for me mm. to pay my way down there. And, and every time I came home, they took up an offering for me. And so mm -hmm. uh, the church just was uh, tremendous. Uh, and uh, and so I was in college and, and I thought about that counselor. Uh, and when I first arrived on campus, the very first exam that we had, uh, some of my classmates said that we have the answers to the to the exam, uh, and they came and tried and give it to me. I said, I'm, I don't want that. I, I want to do it the right way. I want to prove that I belong here. I don't want to be mm. uh, cheating to, to get through here. I want to do it the right way. Yes. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, <laughs> Lo and behold, the, um, the those who took the exam questions from another test, they changed the exam, uh, and I was able to come out uh, yes, at the top of the class because they they uh, scored on what they call a curve. Then that that is that uh, even if no one got a hundred percent, the person mm -hmm. the highest 
Hans uh, exam got the A, and then everything was scaled down from there. So I got an A in that, and just learned a tremendous lesson from that, and that is never try and take a shortcut the way you want to go. Mm -hmm. I just learned that. Uh, and, and so after that, I went on and finished uh, college, um, uh, graduated number six mm. out of class of 242. And then my last semester there uh, was a straight A student. Amen. Uh, and, you know, that, that just brought tears to my eyes. To, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it sometimes brings tears to my eyes now. Mm. Just uh, simply being able to do that and get a straight A. Uh, and it was the first time that I, it was the first time that I actually had straight A's in any semester. I had mostly A's throughout, but never got all A's uh, uh, in any semester. Uh, and I, then I left there and went into the army uh, as a lieutenant because I was in the ROTC. Mm. And I got in the ROTC because they paid me $16 a, a month. And that was a big help uh, living, on, on, I mean, living on campus and having just a little chain mm -hmm. in my pocket. Uh, and so I, comp I completed college and went off to Fort Carson, Colorado, uh, as a lieutenant, uh, I had actually gotten married mm. my junior and senior year, uh, and uh, my wife uh, joined me out there, and uh, and she did not uh, uh, join me when I went out because uh, she was expecting our first child, uh, and so. She joined me out there, and uh, we stayed out there for two years and came back to Philadelphia. I became a probation officer, mm. uh, a juvenile probation officer, and stayed in that position for a period of uh, three or four months. Uh, and I left, uh, and although it was a good job, it was a guaranteed life appointment. Mm. the job, but I left it <coughs> because, <coughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, I, I left it because they wanted me to report on the children. They wanted me to spy on the children and see mm. what was going on. And I said, I did not come here to spy on children. I came here to help them. And I'm not going. And so I quit, literally. And I went to work for a building maintenance company in Philadelphia, hit it by a man by the name of Milton Clark, uh, and, uh, and, and stayed there. Uh, for a period of time, and then I went to work for Allstate Insurance Company. Mm. It was while I was working at Allstate Insurance Company uh, that another first lady, now a new pastor, by the name of Nettie Taylor, uh, basically uh, said to me, uh, you need to leave that job because you're never going to be noticed out there. Mm. No one ever is going to notice you. Mm -hmm. uh, she said, I, I, I'm, I'm, she said, I'm going to put you in a job. Uh, I never heard about it before. She said, I'm going to put you, I'm going to place you in a job. Mm. And she placed me in a job <clears throat> with the agency called the Philadelphia Council for Community Advancement. Uh, uh, PCCA, uh, and and she placed me there, and uh, and for about three or four months, I was just doing uh, work of collecting information on nonprofit groups in the city, and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, everybody who was in the top position at the agency 
uh, left uh, the uh, the directors and uh, president, everybody just left. And they left, uh, and I found this out later, did not know it then, because the intent of all of them coming to that agency was to uh, be able to have that agency become the operator of the anti-poverty program in Philadelphia. And when the anti-poverty program uh, did not come to them the way mm -hmm. they thought it would, uh, then they all left. Uh, and so the uh, chair of the board at that time was Sadie T. M. Alexander, mm -hmm. first black woman uh, with a uh, law degree in, mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania and the first black woman with a doctorate uh, in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, said to me, we may, as well, we may as well make you uh, the executive director uh, mm -hmm. uh, and see what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I left uh, the uh, the I left uh, uh, what I was doing and became the executive director. Uh, and so people said, "Well, you don't know how to be executive director. You only like." 26, 27 years old, I said, I can learn. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, I uh, was appointed executive director, as I said. Uh, and, and the other thing that Sadie T.M. Alexander said to me, whatever you do, don't apply for any more money from the Ford Foundation. Mm. Because you've gotten enough money from them, and we've not spent it well all the time. Mm. And so uh, I learned while reading the newspaper on Sunday that there was a man by the name of David Carlson at the Ford Foundation who was looking for groups to uh, develop houses using churches and nonprofit groups in cities. Mm. Mm. Uh, and so I applied. Uh, to the Ford Foundation uh, for that money, got a grant, a uh, couple million dollars, mm. and were able to, uh, from 1968 to 1978, I built some 2,000 housing units in the Philadelphia metropolitan area. Amen. Uh, building, by that I mean that I worked with nonprofit groups to help them do everything they need to do. I was what you call a packager. I put together all the packages, got them funding, uh, got them an architect, got them a builder, and did everything. And we were able to do 2,000 uh, housing units in a period of some 10 years. Uh, and out of nowhere, hmm. out of nowhere, uh, but God knew that I, that I was where I was. Amen. Uh, uh, someone from the governor's office called me and said, the governor wants to appoint you to the PUC. Mm. Uh, and I said, what's that? He said, the Public Utility Commission. I said, okay, I've heard of it. Uh, and uh, he wants to make you a member of the PUC because he needs a strong black man and Richard Duran uh, uh, recommended you. Mm. Now, Richard Duran had never met me. Mm. Uh, Richard Duran's sister was editor of the neighborhood newspaper in the Pasco area out in Southwest Philadelphia mm -hmm. and knew about me and wrote about me and told her brother about me. And, mm. uh, and so I was recommended by Dick Duran, and therefore was uh, nominated by the governor, was confirmed by the Senate, uh, 48 to nothing, mm. uh, and uh, went on. And in six months, I was chairman of the, uh, I was chairman of the PUC. Amen. Uh, and, and then 
was there for another year and a half and got another call this time from William Green, mm -hmm. who uh, became mayor. Uh, and at this time, he was running for mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, and a group of Black people in the city, uh, Sam Evans and C. Dolores Tucker, mm -hmm. uh, uh, went to William Green when he was running and said, we we will not support you unless you appoint a uh, Black person, unless you appoint someone Black as managing director. Mm -hmm. And so he made a commitment to appoint me uh, as manager and director. Uh, and so I was appointed as manager and director uh, as soon as he was elected uh, and left the uh, PUC and became manager and director. And, and three years later, uh, after he had been elected and was in office, uh, he had lunch with me mm -hmm. uh, uh, and said, uh, I'm not running for re-election. Mm. Then he looked at me and said, with a smile, uh, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to run for mayor. Mm. He said, what do you mean? You were? I said, do you have any money? I said, no. Do you have a campaign? No. He said, what, who do you have? I said, I have God. Uh, and so he looked at me, this man is crazy. And I looked at him and said, you're crazy not to believe me. Uh, and the very next day, I announced that I would resign in my position as uh, manager and director. And people knew what that meant. I didn't, I didn't immediately say I was running for mayor. Mm -hmm. I used that time to do some organizing. And in a few weeks, I uh, announced I was running for mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so people thought I was crazy. To give up a job like that to run for mayor and said you were running against Frank Rizzo. I said, I know how to beat Frank Rizzo. I, I've studied Frank Rizzo. Mm. Uh, and I said, what do you mean? I said, I've studied him. I said, Frank Rizzo always wins, not so much because more people uh, support him, but because he gets more of the people who support him out to vote than the other people who run against him get mm. out to vote. I said the key to winning is for mine to get for me to get uh an equal uh at least an equal turnout of uh, of black voters mm -hmm. uh, that we get from the white uh community and and uh, I will guarantee you I will win. And mm. and so I went on and had a good campaign and and the first poll I took uh, which was in January after this November meeting I had with him mm -hmm. showed me beating Frank Rizzo 58 to 28 mm. uh, that's percentage point and uh, uh, and, I, and I said that people don't believe that number uh, I said that's what it shows now but uh, that, that's all the votes I'm ever going to get. I mean, the 58% is my number. Uh, what we have to do is make sure he doesn't get uh, anywhere in the 50s mm -hmm. uh, and, and and keep him in the 40s because he, he's going to increase that number beyond what mine is. And I said, and mine will probably be the same as it is now. And what we have to do is turn out uh, the votes Mm -hmm. that people that number and we turned it out and sure enough I beat him 58 percent to 42 percent mm -hmm. in the primary election and went on to win the primary election and went on to win the general election because mm -hmm. people running against me who were not as strong as uh Frank Rizzo and was elected mayor amen uh, the first African American mayor yes sir in the city Mm -hmm. uh, and I tell that story that way uh, because in each instance, there was always someone involved in my life mm -hmm. that recommended me mm -hmm. to someone else who had the power to do something about 
my circumstance mm -hmm. and it placed me in a position where I could do more for people. And and, and I I have now a book, uh, a little not not a book that I wrote, but a book that I a notebook that I write wrote down all of the people mm. made it possible for me to get where I got. Mm. And I understand clearly that that it was God using them mm. uh, to put me where he wanted me to be. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's no way a poor country boy from Seaboard, North Carolina, could have gotten there on his own. So mm -hmm. he used other people uh, to recommend to someone else. And although the other person who had the power to do something for mm -hmm. me uh, did not know me, they had the respect of the people who talk with them that they uh, put me in these positions and enabled me to, in each step I took, uh, to end up in the mayor's office uh, back in 19, uh, back actually in, it was 40 years ago, it was actually uh, uh, next uh, month, uh, November, it would be 40 years that I was uh, elected mayor of the city of Philadelphia. Wow. Uh, and that was 40 years ago. And uh, in my early 40s, I was elected mayor of Philadelphia. Wow. Uh, and and was never involved in any party structure, uh, was never a ward leader, was never a committed mm -hmm. person, was never anything other than uh, a faithful church member and a faithful neighborhood uh, a person and faithful to the young people in the neighborhood. And, and it just grew. It grew from there. Uh, and I uh, became mayor and and then was re-elected uh, four years later and had to beat Edwin Dow and mm -hmm. Frank Rizzo at that time. And what I said to people is never, never don't say that you can't do something. Amen. Uh, th there's no way that anyone um, except me and my family thought that I could beat Frank Rizzo, not mm -hmm. once but twice. And there's no way that people thought I could beat Ed Mandel, mm -hmm. uh, who ran against me in the primary four years later. Uh, and then Frank Rizzo came back and ran against me in the general election as a Republican. And I was able to um, just beat all, both of them uh, in that same year and go on and, uh, and become mayor for a second term. Uh, and I, I said this very clearly. Mm -hmm. That was all God. Mm. Yes, sir. That was all God. There's no way that I could have done that without God using people in my life uh, to be able to get done what was done. Mm -hmm. And there's no way I would have become mayor of this fourth largest city mm -hmm. without God uh there's a God placing around me mm -hmm. and in my life people who helped me and who recommended me and who saw in me uh, my abilities and was able to recommend that to people who had authority to make it possible for me to mm -hmm. be uh where I ended up at. Uh, and I, I just think that in life, we all have to remember mm. if God is on your side, yes, sir. God is directing people to, to help you, if God is moving people in a direction. And I'm not even sure that the people who were, who was recommending me, mm -hmm. even, uh, thought about the fact that God was using them to do something that was impossible to, to happen. Uh, but uh, to them, the impossible became possible. Uh, hmm. God was just using them 
and God was placing me in position where I could be seen, yes. where I could be heard, and where I could demonstrate my ability uh, to run the city as minute manager director, mm. to govern the city as uh, uh, as mayor, uh, and then ended up actually in Washington D.C. Mm. as deputy assistant secretary for the U.S. Department of Education, where I spent uh, uh, some eight years and. To, to be able to do that uh, was something that was just incredible for, from that poor country boy walking alongside his father in a cotton field. Hmm. And my father stopping me and looking at me never said much to me because he was never went to school a day in his life. Hmm. And he looked at me, he stopped the plow, and I was on a plow in the road next to him. And said, Wilson, you're not like I, my other children. You're going to be someone important one day. Mm. Uh, and and I looked at him. And uh, and then uh, my cousin, French Dean Martin, uh, two weeks later, said, uh, Wilson, you're going to be someone important one day. Mm. And, uh, and then I... Uh, did not understand what they meant, uh, but it was my pleasure uh, on my inauguration in January uh, of 1984, uh, 30, uh, 30 years from the day that we arrived in Philadelphia, hmm. I was able to uh, take the oath of office Yes, sir. Uh, as mayor, and I was able to say to my father, "Thank you mm. for your prophetic utterance." Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for uh, believing in me and uh, and telling me that it was possible for me to do something that would make uh, me important. Mm. Uh, and uh, and so um, I just thank to God. All things are possible, yes, and sir. nothing is impossible, mm. because there's there's no there's no other way you can explain my story. Yes, sir. Except that God uh, destined it for me, and God made the way, not through me, but through other people. Yes, sir. Uh, to be able to get where I got in life. Mm. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I, I think back those 40 years back, and I thought I thought a couple of a couple of days ago, we have known each other, been acquainted for about 40 years. Yes, that's right. From the barbershop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our good friend, Reverend Alfonso Patrick, and I had to laugh because I had my time to go into the barbershop and he he would bump me. <laughs> he said, No, the mayor is coming. You have to wait, Wilbur. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember those uh, times in the barbershop where we would we would share and we would we would talk. And so I rejoice that you know little did we know that our paths would continue to come together again and again, and even more so after Reverend Walker passed away and the congregation is looking for a pastor. And I do remember coming down to meet with the congregation, the pulpit committee, and us seeing each other in the hallway. And neither one of us knew that we would be there, and we both had a sense of of joy. And again, how God puts people uh, in in our paths. And so, at 19th Street, I've been there nine years, almost ten years, and we. It seems like it is almost an impossible task. You've encouraged me every step of the way. Trust God. And so, my question is: We've talked about this before. Is is how or I should say, why is it so important for us to preserve the history and the legacy of the 19th Street Baptist Church? Uh, it, it, is, it is absolutely impossible for us to preserve the history of the 19th Street Baptist Church uh, because uh, of the richness that the church brought to that section of Philadelphia. Mm. 
Hmm. That's South Philadelphia, and because of the richness uh, that Pastor Walker had and his gifts that he had uh, in terms of music, in terms of preaching, mm -hmm. in terms of telling the story, in terms of humility, mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of uh, just uh, demonstrating that the impossible could become possible through mm -hmm. all that he did uh, and all that the church had done while he was there and since that time. Uh, and with all of the uh, great men that came out of uh, uh, 19th Street uh, mm -hmm. uh, Baptist Church. All right. So we, we the question was about, you know, the importance of preserving the the legacy of 19th Street. It, it, it's just so important to preserve the legacy of our Black churches, preserve the history, mm -hmm. and preserve uh, all that we know about it. Uh, I... Uh, know that without the first Baptist Church of Pasco in mm. Southwest Philadelphia, I would not be where I am and would not have achieved what I achieved without the two First Lady, uh, Muriel Lemon and Nettie mm. Taylor, uh, basically doing what they did for me. I would not be who I am mm. and would not have become who I became. Uh, so it's very important to preserve the history and to be able to tell the history yes. and tell the stories uh, of uh, our churches because the Black church in many of these communities has been a lifesaver for so many young people. Yes. And we need to be able to tell those stories as mm -hmm. clearly as we can in every way that we can in terms mm -hmm. of the people who came out of it. Uh, and uh, I, I know that it's, it's very, very important. I know that uh, John F. White Jr. Uh, came out of 19th Street Baptist Church uh, and on and went on and was was elected to the state house. Was elected to city council. Mm -hmm. Came uh, the secretary of welfare for the state. And now it's running something called the Consortium. Mm -hmm. uh, and on this coming Saturday, we'll have a street name after him mm -hmm. in Northwest. Uh, he came out of 59th Street. The son, uh, John F. White Sr., uh, just so, so, so important. And there were uh, others who came out of that uh, church, um, Ralph Holmes and, of mm -hmm. course, John F. White Sr., and uh, uh, Cornelius Steffens, all those people came out of there that made an impact on this city. Uh, and I'm sure there are many more that I did not know, but I'm mm. saying that the history of 19th Street Baptist Church helped mold people mm. and shape them because of the teaching and preaching of Reverend Charles Walker. Amen. Amen. And finally, I'll, I'll ask this question. How would you uh, like to inspire future leaders, inspire this this uh, seasoned young pastor, and inspire the 19th Street congregation uh, here in 2023? Well, I said to people all the time uh, that if you need me, call me. Um, if you need advice, call me. I will give you advice. Mm -hmm. If if you want to uh, take a walk sometime, I'll take a walk alongside you and encourage you. And if you want to know uh, how God can take uh, nobody and make them somebody, uh, talk to me about my life. And I will tell you that a poor, tongue-tied country boy from a farm in Seaboard, North Carolina, became the mayor of the fourth largest city in the country. Yes. And when no one even thought about me being mayor at any point except when I announced. Mm. Uh, and that's uh, 
is the story that I can tell. And not only once, but twice I did it. Amen. That begins the best political uh, white men in Philadelphia. Amen. Ed Mandel and Frank Rizzo. Yes, sir. Uh, defeated them to get where I got. I didn't. I did not just walk in. Mm -hmm. I had to defeat other people who were who were uh, basically regarded as the most vulnerable uh, political people in the city at the time and could not be defeated. And I was able to do that. And God took me through all of that and turn it all around. And so, 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 so I just think that, uh, that uh, I'm willing uh, to do what people did for me. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to do what Nettie Taylor did for me, what mm -hmm. Lemon Johnson did for me. Amen. Uh, do what all the faithful members of that church did for me, that every time I came home, they would take and shake my hand and put mm -hmm. the money in my hand and say, go back and uh, and spend it. Uh, and so God uses other people mm -hmm. to make it possible for some of us that may not have had a chance or have a chance at becoming someone that mm -hmm. some may regard as important. But for me, I'm a servant of God. Yes, and sir. a faithful servant of God. Yes, and I believe that God can turn anybody and everybody around if we trust him. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to let the record show that I can c concur. I mean, there have been times we had issues at 19th Street. There were times when they would mistakenly put demolition signs up. I called you immediately and you you went right into action and said, don't worry, I'm going to make a couple, couple phone calls. So I can concur, and I greatly appreciate. I I have a picture on my desk here on my, my digital frame when we uh met at your office a couple of times to remind me of the the great gift of in, inspiration and mentoring. So I greatly appreciate you, Reverend Good. Well, we're going to uh come to an conclusion on this this interview, and I I can't thank you enough, Reverend Good. I look forward to our our monthly meetings. And um, I pray that God continue to bless you, your wife, and your family, and that your legacy will continue to go on. In fact, it, through me, I can tell people how you have inspired my life and inspired me you know, over the past 40 years. So I want to say thank you. And thank you for uh, being there and, and carrying on the legacy of 19th Street Baptist Church. And thank you for being who you are, for being an example for young people that you're working with every day mm -hmm. uh, and for being an example of a family man yeah. uh, that takes care of his wife and children. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Reverend Good. Thank you so much. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you, Reverend Good. Thank you. Take care.